All right. Well, here we go. Did you all have a good time? That was awesome. Yes. It's a little overcast here if you're in Georgia. And so we just needed to get some energy through the screen to you today. So I know your heart rate is going. Settle it down a little bit. Take a little bit of a drink of water. And we're about to get started with our program. So Dr. Parker is going to come on. Thank you. Yes, that was so much fun. John just, he's contagious. His energy is amazing. Um, we appreciate him. And he's been rocking with us since March 31st of 2020. And so it's just been a joy to have him every week get us moving. I hope you've been able to um, adopt and adapt some of the moves he's introduced us to to keep you active and moving. So as I said, we're gonna hear from Dr. Monica Parker. She's gonna be talking about behaviors in dementia. Then we're gonna hear from Jenny Helms. She's gonna be uh, addressing respite care. Then we're gonna hear from Jennifer Jen, who's gonna be talking about uh, medical decision-making for individuals with memory loss. So get ready. I hope you have your pen and pad. Welcome Dr. Parker. Thank you, but I'm not sure, did Jenny, I know uh, Jenny Helms has to go, so I'm happy to go, let Jenny go first. It doesn't matter. I I'm here with you, whichever you want. I'll let you go first, because I know you're trying to do two workshops. Okay. It's so good to be with you all. And, and, and any time I'm with Dr. Parker is a happy time for me. I just love her and love her great work, and I'm so glad you all have her. But, you know, Dr. Parker is a caregiver too, so she knows that caregivers need to learn about respite. So she invited me to join you all today and talk to you about your options because most of the time we find that people who are caring for a loved one do so because they want to do it, but even caregivers do get worn out, worn down, and we'd like for you to have help and maybe, you know, not get so worn down. So whenever you need it, we want you to go for it, but you have to know what it is ahead of time so you can make your plans. And so there are a couple of different options for you. One is get your friends and family to be your tribe. I call them a tribe because they need to circle the wagon and you need to be real clear with them about what you want, when you want it. Like you want your husband to take your mama to your, her doctor's appointments or you want your daughter to go pick up something from the drugstore. But if you can get real clear, you'll get a lot more help if you just, rather than just being vague about needing some help. So make your list of who you need, what they're good for, how they can help you and tell them what you need. Another affordable form of respite is in the church affiliated adult day centers, and these are all mission driven. They're also not for profit. And so they only charge what it costs to keep them going. And you can find out about your adult, your uh, church run adult day centers through your area agency on aging in the Metro Atlanta area. That is the Atlanta Regional Commission. And all of these folks, the different area agencies on aging do have both a phone number and a website. So you would just Google Area Agency on Aging for your area. And the good news is they have information on all the different types of respite and they have counselors who can help you figure out what best, best suits your needs. So the other forms include in-home care. And sometimes for the uh, caregiver, it's easier to not have to go out. So sometimes they choose this route. But the upside of the adult day centers is there's a lot of social interaction. There are a lot of other people there to love up on your loved one and give them fun things to do so that they are stimulated. They are around people who care about them. And when they come home, they sleep well at night. So consider that as an option. And again, your area agency on aging can give you that information. If you choose in-home care, you're probably looking at a minimum of four hours a day. And uh, the average rate now is around $22 an hour. But with adult day and with in-home care, if your loved one fits the requirements of someone who would otherwise be in a nursing home without your support, then, and your income fits the categories, then you might would qualify for the Medicaid funded in-home care or adult day. So again, your area agency on aging can answer that question for you. And then if you wanted to go on a vacation and uh, go somewhere, have maybe a long weekend to yourself, 
or maybe pack your bags and head to the beach because you've been locked up here for a year, then consider respite in assisted living. This is private pay in, in assisted living, but it's sometimes that we can get away will just totally refresh you. So if you call your area agency on aging, they can tell you all of the options. They can really get into the specifics. You can tell where you live. You want, for example, in a five mile radius, and they have a database where they can pull up all of that information. But one thing I like to stress is you need to know these things ahead of time because you never know when you might need to make a weekend trip to see another family member or whether you might need to go into a hospital for a procedure. And so uh, contact your area agency on aging ahead of time, find out this information, get comfortable with your options so that you actually make use of this great option. Then I just wanna open it up for any kind of questions you might have on this. Dr. Parker, did I miss anything? I sent you a handout to, that you could use that has this information in it. I sent it actually to you, Cornelia. Okay, and I will send that out uh, when we do the post, um, a, a post event link where we send the actual recording. Um, but we wanted to bring Jenny on because she is an expert when it comes to respite care. And you, there were several of you last week that wanted clarification about respite care. Um, and so Jenny walked you through what those different um, peers are, I would say. And if you could repeat the phone number, Jenny, for the, is it for the Empower Line or? Yes, for the Empower Line, which is the Metro Atlanta region, that number is 404-463-3333. And you can also find them on the web at um, www empowerline.org. And there's a specific tab on there for respite. So they'll break it down for you. And okay, now the questions are coming in. How do you determine if home care or facility care is best? Well, part of that depends on your loved one. If your loved one is a very sociable person, then maybe getting out like into adult day might be for them. If they're a person that doesn't really care to be around a lot of other people, then maybe the in-home care might be the one. If they're a day when they feel kind of outgoing and you know they like activities and, and different social things, then that's a good alternative. And then also I'd like to add that with the adult day, uh, health program, they do have medical oversight. They have nurses there that can provide medications and that can also keep the eyes on your loved one. And so that oversight, medical oversight is worth a lot as well. Excellent. Okay, I think those are all the questions. Thank you again so much, Jenny. We Thank will be you. inviting you back on to even share with us resources about leading age as Super. well. Oh, that would be wonderful. I appreciate you all and all you do. Thank you. Okay, well, Dr. <coughs> Parker, are you ready to? I am. Uh, thank you to all 213 of you who have tuned in today. Um, just to kind of go over some things, let me just comment on something that Miss Ginny talked about. The question in the chat and also on Q&A is, there's so many facilities, how do you choose? And when do you make that decision, okay? You make the decision when it's difficult for you or anybody else in your family to manage that person's care at home. Not because you can't, but either because you don't have the time, the patience, um, I won't say the resources, but resources are more than just financial, they're emotional too. So if your person requires more care than you can manage alone, you need to feel free and feel guilt less about asking for additional help. Now, whether you hire somebody to come into your home to provide that care, or you feel it's important for your family member to be in a residential care facility, like a memory care unit in an assisted living facility, you, we all have to make decisions and choices that make our lives easier. So it's not good for you to take care of somebody 
if you don't have the resources, the emotional, the financial, and the physical resources to do that. And if their caregiving requires a lot more than you are able to manage for whatever reason. If you need help making that determination, this is something you can discuss with your medical doctor, but we now have a service provided by caseworkers or case managers. If you're a Medicare recipient, some people have a case manager that's assigned to them. You also have professional case managers that you can call. Now, professional case managers do require a fee. Visiting with them is the same as visiting with the doctor. But please feel free to consult these individuals to help you and your family arrive at the decision that makes the most sense for you. Caregiving is not a one size fits all proposition. So one of the reasons, one of the things that we're gonna talk about today are behaviors in dementia. And unfortunately, a lot of us have family members who are living with dementia who have behaviors that are obnoxious and quite frankly challenging for many of us. And it's when these behaviors get to the point where we can't manage them, we want them to go somewhere. And that's being, I guess, as diplomatic as I can possibly be. Next, please. I wanna make sure that you understand the difference between disturbing behaviors and people with dementia, try to give you an idea of what some of these disturbing behaviors may be and help you to develop a strategy uh, for responding to some of these behaviors such that you can maintain order, civility and maintain your own mental health. Okay, next. So most commonly reported for families um, coming to the doctor is they wander, they wander out of the house. You don't know where they're there, where they are. They're like little kids. You either have to put a tap, you know, put a tether on them so that you know where they are or microchip them. You'd love to microchip them because you don't know where they are. Wandering becomes problematic when people wander outside of their home and wander into the street or wander away from you in a public place and they can't tell you or tell somebody else where they are or even who they are. So when people start repeating words, phrases, statements and stories, we don't, that doesn't really bother us, that annoys us, but a lot of people don't investigate. And I will say that if you have a relative who is doing something like this, you need to get to the doctor. People who don't sleep well at night, sleeplessness. They're up at all hours of the night. They get their days and their nights mixed up. They're asleep when everybody else is awake and they're awake when everybody else is asleep such that nobody else gets to go to sleep. And the key things for me as a provider, um, besides wandering, that was the number one complaint. The second thing is they urinate and defecate in all the wrong places, any place but the toilet. And this becomes particularly difficult when you change their familiar environment. If they've lived in the same house for the last 40 or 50 years, the bathroom is in a certain place. If you move them out of the environment that they've lived in for the last 40 or 50 years, and then move them to your spanking brand new house or mother-in-law unit somewhere, they don't know where the bathroom is. Because they get lost, they're gonna go to the bathroom in the wrong place. So be mindful that when you change an older person's environment, particularly if they have cognitive impairment, that they are likely to have accidents and not be able to contain themselves when they have to urinate or defecate. So making sure that they know where to go to the bathroom and they can take them every two hours and schedule, that's important. Keep going. So what are some of the uh, most common behavioral disturbance? Non-psychotic agitation, some people that get irritable, some people that hallucinate is sometimes uh, a, a problem. They see children. When people start hallucinating and see children and animals that aren't really there, I like to think that there's generally something medical going on as well. And they probably need to see the doctor because they may be dehydrated. They may have an infection and or maybe their medications aren't right. Chronic anxiety, chronic depression manifests itself as apathy or crying all the time. And some people whose behaviors change to the point where they become violent or threatening. She doesn't wanna do anything and she hits me if I try to help her to go to the bathroom. She hits me if I try to get her to bathe. So those are the kinds of behaviors that really drive family members crazy, family caregivers crazy. Next, please. Okay, so why do these behaviors occur? Any number of reasons, but I would say 
that most importantly, the brain is not able to recognize um, the body symptoms. And so the people behave in accordance with what they think they're interpreting, okay? A lot of times people are not able to control their behaviors. But more importantly, they can't explain to you what's going on that may be triggering them. They're not aware that these behaviors are obnoxious or difficult. But keep in mind, these behaviors are evidence of the fact that there is some damage to the nervous system that is occurring and it needs to be investigated. These people generally cannot help these behaviors. So screaming and hollering at them isn't gonna make them change their behaviors. If anything, it makes it worse. Keep going. Okay, what are some things that may precipitate bad behaviors? Okay, I alluded to a change in environment for people not being able to find the right place to go to the bathroom. Okay, so if I've lived in the same house for years and years, I know where the kitchen is, I know where the bathroom is, I know where the laundry room is. So I might be able to better take care of myself in that environment versus taking me out of that environment, whether I need to go or not, and putting me in my child's new house or putting me in an assisted living facility. So because I don't recognize the place, because I'm wary and I don't recognize the people, I may act out a little bit, okay? Sometimes people don't like loud noises. They don't like things that they're familiar with. They don't like crowds of behavior. These sorts of things can be intimidating. So when we think of overstimulating, I'm gonna say this and pandemic has curbed a lot of this, but in a setting where you wanna celebrate milestones, mom's 80, 70, 90, 100, let's give her a big birthday party, don't. Okay, she's probably going to misbehave because all of the noise, all of the people are going to be frightening and overwhelming to him or her. That's not a good thing. Okay, a change in caregiver. Some caregivers aren't doing anything bad. They're just different. And the person, the care recipient doesn't recognize this person, doesn't know this person. So they're not going to do what they would do for the old person. If I say, Mrs. Brown, let's get up and you know go to the bathroom. Mrs. Brown may rear back because she doesn't know who you are. So be very careful that when you're changing caregivers and you're introducing a new caregiver into your loved one's routine, that there is a period of time where you introduce them gradually and let them get used to them. Because strangers, even if they're relatives, keep in mind people with dementia don't necessarily recognize their relatives. And if it's somebody that they're not accustomed to looking at and they're not familiar with, they're going to be resistant to doing anything for them, to responding to them in any way. Keep going. What are some triggers for bad behaviors? As I've alluded to before, infections, pain. Um, I've had patients that have had fractures because they fell, but they couldn't tell me that they were in pain. They couldn't tell their family members they were in pain. And so what they did was they wouldn't move. They didn't, they didn't stand up because they had a broken fibula and it hurt for them to stand up. They wouldn't stand or move because they might've had a broken hip. They fell, they hit the floor and well, the caregiver said she looks all right, but you know now she's not moving. Well, if they're not moving and this is a significant change in their physical or emotional behavior, think something is wrong. Somebody who's not sleeping well, somebody who's not getting well to sleep. Um, may behave differently. And somebody who's hungry, it's like, oh, she doesn't eat very much. She doesn't eat very much. Well, I put the food in front of her. She didn't eat it. Well, a lot of times when you put food and slap trays down in front of people, they might need help opening the cups. They might need help manipulating the utensils. People with dementia lose fine motor movement. This is one of the things we talked about many months ago. They lose the ability to have fine grip, so they can't pick up a spoon. They can't pick up a, for, uh, a fork. So maybe if you put a bowl of grapes there, they'd reach for the grapes and they put the grapes in the mouth. Maybe they would do a chicken wing and they'd put a chicken wing in their mouth. Maybe they'd hold the sandwich better than if you put a tray of food in front of them, slapped it down and walked out of the room. Unfortunately, that's what happens a lot when people are in facilities where they don't have a dedicated caregiver. The caregiver doesn't mean not to help that person. It just means that they're not aware that the person they're caring for does not have the ability to open the cup of juice, to pick up the spoon, to pick up the fork, 
and eat things. They can use their hands and some lots of family members get all upset when somebody with dementia uses their hands to eat. Don't get upset, just find a finger food that is socially appealing to you that they can manage to feed themselves. Okay, that way you won't be embarrassed and they won't be embarrassed. And if it's gonna be a problem for you, you keep them at home where it doesn't matter. Keep going. Okay, how do you manage behaviors? Depending upon what the behaviors are, in general, we don't like to use medications. That's what non-pharmacologic means. We're not gonna use a medication. And just because somebody has dementia and maybe they walk a lot, maybe they repeat themselves a lot, doesn't mean they need a medication. Unfortunately, the practice in our culture has been that if somebody's wandering around at night or not sleeping when other people are sleeping, we give them really strong medications to make them go to sleep or to make them sit down. But that has side effects and problems. People who are drugged don't eat. They're more confused. They can get dehydrated. And then on top of our ongoing dementia, you begin to have a problem with how their body functions. So the best thing is to establish a routine in a familiar environment and keep people on a schedule. I had one um, family, the woman had like about 12 children. She resided with her youngest daughter and her youngest daughter was the sergeant for everybody. She said, this is mama's routine. She gets up at this time, she eats at this time, she gets her medicine at this time. And the children had two week top blocks of time where they came to their sister's house to help take care of and supervise their mother. That was fine for their mother. People would say, well, that's an inconvenience. Well, it might be for you, but the objective is to make sure that the person that you love has a decent quality of life and is safe and is in a place where they feel comfortable. Next, please. So medications um, can be used to help manage behaviors when some of your behavioral strategies like the structure of the day and activities don't work. So you're familiar with denepazil, which is something called Aricep, galantamine, which is Razadine and Rivastigmine, Exelon. Those are cholinesterase inhibitors. Antidepressants, things like Celexa, Zoloft, Lexapro, Trazodone, those sorts of things may be used to kind of help people's mood, keep them from crying, maybe even used to kind of help um, improve their appetite to some degree and or sleep. The last class of medications, antipsychotics, Risperdal, Seroquel, Abilify, Geodon, those are medications that are psychiatric medications generally used to control psychiatric behaviors. People who had chronic schizophrenia or paranoia before dementia probably still need these medications. But just to have somebody who has dementia, we don't generally put people on these medications. If somebody starts hallucinating and they've never done it before, we need to do a medical evaluation to make sure that there's not a metabolic problem or an illness that may be triggering that problem. So we need to get them to a doctor. And for some family members, it's easier to keep people drugged, but keep in mind that's not the best thing for the patient and not necessarily the best thing for you either. So, so non-medical management for people with dementia, I've alluded to this before, establishing a daily routine that is similar every single day. It may be monotonous and boring for you, but for the person living with dementia, they understand what they're supposed to do at a certain place and time. They understand the people and they recognize the people that are in that environment all the time. A consistent environment. It's not just the physical location that must be, should be the same, but the temperature. Some people that have extremes in temperature, being cold, being hot. And keep in mind, these people can't tell you they're hot or they're cold. So their behavior is probably going to change. Too much noise, too much television, too many radios caregivers talking on telephones and not paying attention to the care recipient, all the excessive noise, excessive stimulation can be disruptive to people and disturbing, excuse me, to persons living with dementia. And always build in some daily physical activity. If you build in a little bit more physical activity during the day, near the end of the day, late afternoon, they're less likely to wanna to get up and wander and bolt out of the house. So if you can get them up physically moving, we just did dancing with John. Somebody said well, that's more of a performance than exercise. Well, for some of us, this is the only exercise we get, <laughs> okay? 
So for older people with dementia, giving them some kind of physical activity gets rid of a lot of static energy that, and frustration that they may feel. Build in a daily walk into their day. So after you've gotten them up, fed, given them breakfast, let's go outside for a walk. As we end our day after dinner, let's go for a walk. And I think that if you have a scheduled exercise and walking, that kind of gets rid of some of that urge to wander or to walk around. If you have grandchildren and young adults, teenagers, adolescents who can help walk that person or amuse that person living in your house, it makes your job as a primary caregiver a whole lot easier. Next. In summary, I'd like you to know that people's bad behaviors, whether it's wandering, not sleeping well, uh, becoming belligerent, is not something that they can control. It's the behavior, the behavior is an outgrowth of the manifestation of the neurodegenerative process. There are some medications we use to manage these behaviors, but in general, we don't want you to use medications because they have untoward side effects. We'd rather you develop behavioral strategies and techniques to help manage behaviors and control their day. To get further information and advice about how to do that, an occupational therapist who can be found in any nursing home and in a um, residential facility generally is the person who can help you establish and develop a routine. And you can ask your medical doctor to ask for a referral or to write a referral for you to see an occupational therapist such that you can get this advice. Now, why did I tell you to do it that way? Because consulting with an occupational therapist is a medical thing and your medical insurance, your Medicare with whatever insurance you have, your Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, Blue Cross, Blue Shield will pay for it and it is not an out-of-pocket expense. With that, I'm going to close and go in here and answer some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parker. There are a few in the Q&A. Okay, I wouldn't use any medications to help people sleep. I just want to get that one out of the way. <coughs> Go on to your next provider. Um, All right. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome. Hi. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, my. My name is Jennifer Jin, and I'm a current senior at Emory University in the Neuroscience and Behavioral Biology program. And for my honors thesis, I am conducting research concerning medical decision making in people with memory loss. I first became interested in this topic through my experience working at a startup called MapHabit. I helped with the clinical studies we were doing with the help of Crystal and Dr. Parker with caregivers of people with Alzheimer's from local church communities. Through this experience, I um, had many opportunities to speak directly with both caregivers and individuals um, impacted by memory loss and other impairments from Alzheimer's. And I quickly learned how important protecting independence was to the people living with memory loss, especially with those that showed very mild presentations of Alzheimer's. And this experience engaged my interest in better understanding how the capacity to make medical decisions is determined for people with, med uh, with memory loss. Um, next slide, please. Um, according to the National Institute of Aging, America's 65 and over population is projected to nearly double over the next three decades, from 48 to 88 million by 2050. And life expectancy is also projected to increase by nearly eight years, from roughly 68 to 76 years. Forgetfulness is a normal part of aging, and since this population is only projected to increase, it is likely that more and more people will be impacted by it. Again, it's a normal sign of aging, but it becomes a bigger issue when mild forgetfulness turns into serious memory problems and cognitive impairments. Cognitive impairments and decline are characterized by a host of symptoms, including disruptions in language, memory, attention, recognition, problem solving, and decision making. These symptoms can interfere with activities of daily living and thus people with such impairments may need assistance from caregivers or family members. The issue I would like to discuss 
and focus on today occurs when someone's cognitive impairments progress to a point when their ability to make their own decisions concerning their own medical care is called into question. Next slide. What is a medical decision? It's essentially a statement committing to a particular course of medical action. The definition is really broad and covers actions like starting, stopping, or continuing particular medical treatments, diagnostic tests, prescriptions, and even instructions regarding diet and physical activity. For example, let's say I have di diabetes and my physician tells me that I can either take insulin that is short acting versus long acting. Whatever therapy I choose would be considered a medical decision. So who is allowed to make these decisions? It comes down to a matter of capacity. Next slide. Uh, medical decision-making capacity is your ability to make decisions about your medical treatment and care. Capacity is usually determined by four key components, understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and communicating a choice. Understanding is the ability to comprehend the situation and its relevant information, including diagnostic and treatment information. You would be able to fulfill this component if you understood things like the state of your health currently, the physician's recommended treatment and its potential risks and benefits, as well as risks and benefits to any alternative treatments and even no treatment. Appreciation is relating this information and the consequences of that particular medical decision to your own personal situation. This is really similar to understanding, but the difference is that with appreciation, you need to apply the factual knowledge from the understanding component to how it relates to your own unique medical situation. Some things you'd need to consider are how the treatment would affect you specifically and why you believe your doctor recommended it for your particular health concern. Third, reasoning is the ability to rationally compare treatment options and the consequences of each. You need to be able to explain things like why you decided to accept or reject the recommended treatment and what made it a better or even best option for you compared to the other treatment options. And finally, communicating a choice is simply that. You must be able to convey your treatment choice in a clear manner. Next. Um, Though making decisions about one's own medical care seems like an obvious right, it becomes complicated in individuals with cognitive impairments. This is because cognitive impairments can affect many executive functions of the brain that can diminish one or more of the four components of capacity. For instance, impairments to short-term and semantic memory, which is general world knowledge that we have all accumulated over time, can affect understanding and reasoning. Deterioration of attention, planning, organization, and cognitive flexibility can all impact understanding, appreciation, and reasoning. And finally, expression of a choice can be affected by difficulty with language and communication. Not only this, but neural degeneration begins 20 years or more before actual symptoms arise. So it can be really difficult to ascertain when someone's decision-making capacity becomes compromised. However, decisional capacity is critical in obtaining informed consent and patient authorization for any medical treatment. Next. So what can we do? We must first understand that people with cognitive impairments such as memory loss do not automatically have impaired capacity. They may still be able to make their own decisions and those on their care team, including family members, caregivers, physicians, and even researchers should do their best to protect their autonomy. Cognitive evaluations with simple short tests can help assess an impaired individual's baseline executive function. Not only this, but continuous testing and evaluation of the impaired individual's condition may also be helpful. If it is possible, engage in conversations with the impaired individual about their desires. This avenue of communication can help affirm their identity and feelings of independence and control while grappling with neurological symptoms that may be taking those things away. A few weeks ago, the ADRC hosted legal workshops in partnership with Emory School of Law about getting your affairs in order, like establishing an advanced medical directive or durable power of attorney. By having these in place early, before your loved one's memory loss progresses even more, it can protect their sense of autonomy because these documents can help reflect and protect their true desires. All in all, medical decision-making can be a tricky subject to approach with people with memory loss. 
but it's important to always remember that just because people show signs of impairments, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are automatically and immediately incapable of making their own decisions. Start early in initiating and engaging in conversations about medical decision making and show grace to one another in understanding each other's wants and needs. After all, we all just want to feel heard and understood. Thank you so much for listening and thank you to Dr. Parker, Cornelia, and Crystal for allowing me to come and talk about this topic. Thank you, Jennifer. Bravo. You said this is your senior paper, correct? Yep, it's my senior honors thesis for undergraduate. Yes, your, your thesis. So that's one of our missions as a, as a research center. We want to also educate and groom and mentor uh, future generations. The more scientists, the more clinicians we have um, vested in this um, disease, the sooner we are to getting a cure. Okay, Matt, come on really quickly. Tell us what we can expect for the Cognitive Empowerment Program at three o'clock. Hey, everyone. Um, oh, can you guys hear me? All right, um, so my name is Matt Doran. I am the moderator for our CP Community Live webinar that happens right after this right now. And uh, today we're gonna be joined by um, Dr. Felicia Goldstein. She is one of our um, great neuropsychologists here on the study. And she's gonna be talking about um, cognitive strategies to help with people with mild cognitive impairment and which also might be helpful for um, if anyone else has any other, um, you know, like memory difficulties, so. Please join us in a few minutes. I will post a link uh, to that uh, down in chat. Kudos to you, kudos to Jennifer. Uh, good job, great job. Um, Matt, so Dr. Goldstein is gonna be talking about specifically what again? I believe she's gonna be talking about di di different cognitive um, like strategies that kind of help with everyday functioning. Okay. So, uh, and Dr. Parker, you may want to expound on that. I mean, there is a calendaring system that you alluded mm -hmm. to many um, of the examples here shortly, but Dr. Goldstein is going to give you a few more strategies if you want to jump on after Brain Talk Live today. Yeah. And, and we do like a, a wide variety of that kind of stuff in, in the CEP program. And just like you said, the calendar training is one of the, the biggest programs that we do. That or that Dr. Goldstein does specifically. So, so can the average lay person get involved in any of these programs to learn about these strategies, Matt? Yeah, you guys can join us um, by following, coming to our webinar in a few minutes, and they and you can and anyone's a, welcome to to join. Okay, and just um, to re to uh, reiterate, um, of those. 132 individuals that completed the um, poll, 36% of you are uh, family members or consider yourself a caregiver. That is significant. So although we want to get to a place ultimately where there is a cure for memory loss um, or we, there are ways to prevent it, um, we're here for you caregivers. We know it is a big job, it's a big to do. Any closing remarks, Dr. Parker? I have none other than to say thank you again for tuning in each week. Um, you've heard a lot about a number of different things. Um, as the spring progress, we'll be getting back into more in-person research events, but please participate in the Emory Healthy Aging Study and their online survey. And as things go along, we'll learn a little bit more, but please continue to turn in every, tune in every week. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, and the CEP uh, link is there in the chat. We'll, we'll repost it. And Dr. Parker, there's another question. Whose responsibility is it to decide uh, executive function and decision-making regarding driving? And you're muted, Dr. P. Executive function and any of the brain functions that we've talked about before is something that is arrived at in consultation with both the medical doctor and the clinical neuropsychologist. The clinical neuropsychologist does a lot of psychometric testing to determine how your brain functions and how you work. That is a special appointment. Dr. Goldstein, who's going to be in the next session, 
is a neuropsychologist and she is the health professional who makes that assessment. Mr. Jones has a deficit in an executive function. Mr. Jones has a visual spatial deficit. Those are generally done by PhD doctors. Medical doctors like primary care doctors like myself and neurologists find organic reasons for changes, but the actual psychometric testing is done by a neuropsychologist and that kind of testing may or may not be paid for by your insurance carrier. Okay, the other question that I have here is what causes weight loss in dementia? Keep in mind, the brain doesn't read messages, um, interpret signs and signals the way normal intact people do. People lose weight in dementia because they forget to eat. They don't recognize that they are hungry. And because they don't recognize that they're hungry, they don't eat, okay? And so scheduling their meals and supervising their meal time, making sure that there's somebody around when they eat helps them to continue to eat. Remember, dementia is a neurodegenerative process. It is not um, something that's necessarily um, fixable with a medication, not right now anyway. So people lose weight with dementia because they lose the ability to recognize signs and symptoms of hunger or the ability to respond to them. So if somebody has dementia and they know they're hungry, they don't see any food that they can access, they can't open a can, they can't operate a microwave, they don't get to eat. It's very simple. Um, but people don't realize those are all parts of dementia. And if you want more information, the best primer we have for Alzheimer's is something called Alzheimer's University that's issued by the Wild Cornell Medical Center. They have a very easy to follow um, program, www.alzu.org. They have an excellent primer for brain loss, brain dysfunction, and it goes through a lot of the things that we've talked about today. So please look at that website. Again, I have to thank you all so much for participating with us today. See two more questions in the... Okay, so I can go, um, for those of you who don't have to jump off, I will answer these out loud because they're pretty universal questions. The website I um, alluded to is, um, okay, Crystal put it in the chat. Good suggestions for impulsivity, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Right, okay. Again, I want you to work with an occupational therapist to help manage somebody's behavior. Is there a relationship between TIAs, hospital delirium, and post-hospital cognitive impairment? Well, most people who have been in a hospital who are pro in a prolonged um, acute medical situation may experience hospital delirium. That's because there's too much noise, they're not getting a lot of sleep, a whole lot of stuff goes wrong. Generally in hospital delirium, which is reversible, once they're out of that hospital environment and in a more quiet, sedate environment, that resolves. Now, transient ischemic attacks, that's what a TIA, those are mini strokes. Those things are cumulative and over time you do develop some cognitive dysfunction. Is it recoverable? No, okay. Um, post anesthesia delirium, okay. A lot of people who've been under deep um, anesthesia for a surgical procedure like repairing a hip or something else will have some anesthesia induced um, confusion that should also resolve. Anytime somebody has an acute medical condition or problem that hasn't been addressed, delirium may likely be a consequence. And as soon as the medical problem is resolved, the delirium generally resolves. Delirium is a medical emergency. We have to figure out what the medical emergency is, address that medical emergency, and generally the delirium should resolve. It may not be instantaneous, however, and people have to be a little patient on that score. And I think that that's, that's it. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you all back here next week at two o'clock.